Well, welcome back to the second part of November 22nd today in history. Two Long Island Railroad commuter trains collided on this day in 1950, killing 79 people. Defective equipment caused this horrific rear-end collision, the worst in the history of the Long Island Railroad. The accident occurred in the Richmond Hills section of Queens. A 12-car train carrying commuters from Manhattan to Hempstead on Long Island was ordered to slow down as it entered the station in Queens. Engineer William Murphy cut the speed to 15 miles per hour and then to a complete stop. And as the train stood still on the tracks, rear flagman Bertram Biggin got off the train with a red lamp in order to warn any approaching trains of its presence. Soon the train got a green light to move on, and the Hempstead train attempted to restart its journey. Biggin got back on the train, but the stop had caused the train's brakes to lock. The express train to Babylon was on the same tracks, just minutes behind, and had green lights to proceed. It hit the rear of the Hempstead train, going 40 miles per hour, smashing into it and under the rear car, throwing it high into the air. Benjamin Pocorny, the motorman of the Babylon train, was killed, along with everyone traveling in the rear car. Another 363 people suffered significant injuries. New York City Mayor Vincent Impelitari called the Long Island Railroad disaster a disgraceful common carrier following the discovery that defective equipment that was not maintained properly was responsible for the accident. Millions of dollars in damages were eventually paid to the victims and their families. This one I remember well and I with much sorrow. November 22, 1963, John Fitzgerald Kennedy, the 35th President of the United States, was the fourth president to be assassinated while traveling in, a, in, in his case, traveling in a parade through Dallas, Texas, in an open-top convertible. First Lady Jacqueline Kennedy rarely accompanied her husband on political outings, but she was beside him, along with Texas Governor John Connolly and his wife, for a 10-mile motorcade through the streets of downtown Dallas on November 22nd. Sitting in a Lincoln convertible, the Kennedys and Connellys waved at the large and enthusiastic crowds gathered along the parade route. As their vehicle passed the Texas School Book Depository Building at 12.30 p.m., Lee Harvey Oswald allegedly fired three shots from the sixth floor, fatally wounding President Kennedy and seriously injuring Governor Connolly. Kennedy was pronounced dead 30 minutes later at Dallas Parkland Hospital. He was only 46. Vice President Lyndon Johnson, who was three cars behind President Kennedy in the motorcade, was sworn in as the 36th President of the United States at 2.39 p.m. He took the presidential oath of office aboard Air Force One as it sat on the runway at Dallas Love Field Airport. The swearing-in was witnessed by some 30 people, including Jacqueline Kennedy, who was still wearing clothes stained with her husband's blood. Seven... I just burped, honey. Do cut that. Seven minutes later, the presidential jet took off for Washington. The next day, November 23rd, 
President Johnson issued his first proclamation declaring November 25th to be a day of national mourning for the slain president. On that Monday, hundreds of thousands of people lined the streets of Washington to watch a horse-drawn caisson bear Kennedy's body from the Capitol Rotunda to St. Matthew's Catholic Cathedral for a requiem mass. The solemn procession then continued on to Arlington National Cemetery, where leaders of 99 nations gathered for the state funeral. Kennedy was buried with full military honors on a slope below Arlington House, where an eternal flame was lit by his widow to forever mark the grave. Lee Harvey Oswald, born in New Orleans in 1939, joined the U.S. Marines in 1956. He was discharged in 1959, and nine days later left for the Soviet Union, where he tried unsuccessfully to become a citizen. He worked in Minsk, married a Soviet woman in, a, in 1962, was allowed to return to the United States with his wife and infant daughter. In early 1963, he bought a 38 revolver and rifle with a telescopic sight by mail order. And on April 10th in Dallas, he allegedly shot at and missed former U.S. Army General Edwin Walker, a figure known for his extreme right-wing views. And later that month, Oswald went to New Orleans and founded a branch of the Fair Play for Cuba Committee, a pro-Castro organization. And in September 1963, he went to Mexico City, where investigators alleged that he attempted to secure a visa to travel to Cuba or return to the USSR. In October, he returned to Dallas and took a job at the Texas School Book Depository Building. Less than an hour after Kennedy was shot, Oswald killed a policeman who questioned him on the street near his rooming house in Dallas. Thirty minutes later, Oswald was arrested in a movie theater by police, responding to reports of a suspect. He was formally arraigned on November 23rd for the murders of President Kennedy and Officer J.D. Tippett. On November 24th, Oswald was brought to the basement. I'll never forget seeing this. It, 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 it's the only man I can remember. No, I've seen two men murdered. One was Oswald, the other was, of course, John Kennedy, three men, and another was Robert Kennedy, all by television, of course, that I saw them. On November 24th, Oswald was brought to the basement of the Dallas Police Headquarters on his way to a more secure county jail. A crowd of police and press, with live television cameras rolling, gathered to witness his departure. As Oswald came into the room, Jack Ruby emerged from the crowd and fatally wounded him with a single shot from a concealed thirty-eight revolver. Ruby, who was immediately detained, claimed that rage at Kennedy's murder was the motive for his action, and some called him a hero, but he was nonetheless charged with first-degree murder. Jack Ruby, originally known as Jacob Rubenstein, operated strip joints and dance halls in Dallas and had minor connections to organized crime. He features prominently in the Kennedy assassination theories, and many believe that he killed Oswald to keep him from revealing a larger conspiracy. In his trial, Ruby denied the allegation and pleaded innocent on the grounds that his great grief over Kennedy's murder had caused him to suffer psychomotor epilepsy. That was his claim. And shoot 
Oswald unconsciously. The jury found Ruby guilty of murder with malice and sentenced him to die. In October 1966, the Texas Court of Appeals reversed the decision on the grounds of improper admission of testimony and the fact that Ruby could not have received a fair trial in Dallas at the time. In January 1967, while awaiting a new trial to be held in Wichita Falls, Ruby died of lung cancer in a Dallas hospital. Now, the official Warren Commission report of 1964 concluded that neither Oswald nor Ruby were part of a larger conspiracy, either domestic or international, to assassinate President Kennedy. Despite its seemingly firm conclusions, the report failed to silence conspiracy theories surrounding the event. They continue to this day. And in 1978, the House Select Committee on Assassinations concluded in a preliminary report that John Kennedy was probably assassinated, this is a quote, as a result of conspiracy. Quote, end quote that may have involved multiple shooters and organized crime. The committee's findings, as with those of the Warren Commission, continue to be widely disputed. I, I'll just do an aside on this. If you examine the Warren Commission and what they got as evidence and what they left out of testimonies, um, there's a lot of suspicion around it. What really happened? If Donald Trump becomes president, maybe he'll find out. <laughs> and maybe not. <laughs> because of the worldwide news and every media regarding the assassination of President John Kennedy, the death of C.S. Lewis, beloved apologist, scholar, and author, was all but ignored. C.S. Lewis was a 65-year-old Anglican scholar. He was well-known and loved throughout the world, too, for his children's classics, The Chronicles of Narnia, The Screwtape Letters, and The Great Divorce. But there are so many other books that he has written that are so worth reading, even today. One of the, my favorites is Mere Christianity. C.S. Lewis was born Clive Staples Lewis in 1898. His mother died of cancer when he was still very young, and he and his brother Warren who was three years older when his mother died just like the Bavenzi children in the land the witch in the wardrobe their father sent the boys away this time to a boarding school where I'm not sure they had a wardrobe but anyway at that school C.S. Lewis abandoned his childhood faith in Christ in 1916, Lewis won a scholarship to University College in Oxford. One year later, he enlisted in the British Army during World War I. He was sent to the front lines to fight on his 19th birthday, and he was wounded during the Battle of Arras. He was returned to duty later that year. Once the war was over, he was discharged. One of his great griefs was that his best friend and roommate in high school was killed and buried in the field during the war. No one knows where the grave is. It was during the next year that C.S. Lewis wrote his first magazine article titled Death in Battle. He went on to write book after book, the book that began uh, to gain C.S. Lewis real attention was the first book of his space trilogy out of the silent planet 
which he wrote in 1938. These were followed by screw tape letters. That's a great book that he wrote in weekly segments for the English newspaper, The Guardian, in 1941. Because the Chronicles of Narnia are still the most popular seven books on reachmorenow.com and reachmorenow YouTube, I'm going to list the real order in which he wrote his magnificent series. Now, if you want to look at this list again, all you need to do is go to reachmorenow.com and scroll down under the video, and this will all be there. Down. But these, this was the order in which those books were written. 1950, The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. 1951, Prince Caspian. 1952, The Voyage of the Don Treader. 1953, The Silver Chair. 1954, The Horse and His Boy. 1955, The Magician's Nephew. In 1956, The Last Battle. C.S. Lewis received the Carnegie Medal in recognition of the seven books. And on and on with his book writing. And as I've said already, all of the books that he wrote are well worth reading. One of C.S. Lewis's closest friends for several years was Lord of the Rings author J.R. Dawkins, with whom he met for lunch every week. A group of very distinguished authors met together in the same group to share what they were writing, but Lewis and Tolkien were limited not at all to lunchtime get-togethers. Lewis died on November 22nd, one week before his 65th birthday. He had a variety of illnesses, two of them most especially had a bad heart and kidney trouble. He had resigned his position of professor at Cambridge during this summer preceding his death. November 22nd, 1986, 20-year-old Mike Tyson knocked out 33-year-old Trevor Burbick in just 5 minutes and 35 seconds. Now joyfully, he yelled into the microphone, I'm the youngest heavyweight boxing champion in history, he was. And Tyson told his manager after the fight, and I'm going to be the oldest, but he wasn't. Tyson's bravado wasn't misplaced, and when he walked into the ring to face Burbick, he had won all 27 of the matches that he'd fought, knocking out, get ready, knocking out 26 of his opponents. He threw unbelievably hard punches. Pineapples, trainer Angelo Dundee called them. Uh, Ref Mills Lane agreed, the referee. Everything he's got is good night written all over it, he said. Burbick refused to be intimidated by the younger man's furious arm and decided very unwisely. It turned out to stand up to Tyson instead of boxing him. He didn't bob or weave or even throw punches. He just stood there, wanting to show the world that he could take whatever Tyson was dishing out. Quote, I was trying to prove to myself that I could take his best shot, Burbick said. But he punches pretty hard. <laughs> Tyson had a plan, too. Quote, I wanted to throw every punch with bad intentions, he said after the fight. I was throwing, what can I say, hydrogen bombs. During the first round, Burbick had fought in such slow motion that he looked like he was underwater. Early in the second, Tyson walloped him to the mat with a powerful left hook. The older man bounced up, but Tyson thumped him again. 
Burbick froze, and his legs buckled, and he fell. The referee began to count, while the champ struggled to get up. He lifted himself off the mat twice, and twice his legs wobbled so much that he fell again. He finally made it up, but Lane stopped the fight anyway. Burbick was up, he said, but to allow somebody to get hit in that condition? That's criminal. Tyson kept his title for nine more pouts until Buster Douglas beat him in 1990. And after that, his life unraveled. He was sent to prison for three years for rape. Then five fights into his comeback in 1995, he bit off a part of Evander Holyfield's ear and was disqualified. I saw that fight on television again. He retired for good in 2005. Burbick didn't fare much better. He too spent time in prison for rape and was found dead of chop wounds to his head, according to the coroner's report, in a church courtyard in Jamaica in 2006. November 22, 1988. In the presence of members of Congress and the media, the Northrop B-2 stealth bomber was shown publicly for the very first time at Air Force Plant 42 in Palmdale, California. The aircraft, which was developed in great secrecy for nearly a decade, was designed with stealth characteristics that would allow it to penetrate an enemy's most sophisticated defenses unnoticed. And at the time of its public unveiling, the B-2 had not even been flown on a test flight. It rapidly came under fire for its massive cost, more than, get ready, Forty billion dollars, that's billion with a B, for development, and one billion dollars, that's also billion with a B, price tag, for each unit. In 1989, the B-2 was successfully flown, performing favorably. Although the aircraft had a wingspan of nearly half a football field, its radar signal was as negligible as that of a bird. The B-2 also successfully evaded infrared sound detectors and the visible eye. Following the collapse of the Soviet Union in 1991, the original order for the production of 132 stealth bombers was reduced to 21 aircraft. The B-2 has won a prominent place in the modern U.S. Air Force fleet, serving well in bombing missions during the 1990s. November 22, 1990, Margaret Thatcher, the first woman Prime Minister in British history, announced her resignation after 11 years in Britain's top office. Margaret Hilda Roberts was born in Grantham, England in 1925. In 1959, after marrying businessman Denise Thatcher and giving birth to twins, she was elected to Parliament as a Conservative for Finchley, a North London district. During the 1960s, she rose rapidly in the ranks of the Conservative Party, and in 1967, joined the Shadow Cabinet, sitting in opposition to Harold Wilson's ruling Labour Cabinet. With the victory of the Conservative Party under Edward Heath in 1970, Thatcher became Secretary of State for Education and Science. In 1974, the Labour Party returned to power, and Thatcher served as joint shadow chancellor 
before replacing Edward Health as the leader of the Conservative Party in February 1975. She was the first woman to head the Conservatives. Under her leadership, the Conservative Party shifted for the right in its politics, calling for privatization of national industries and utilities, and promising a resolute defense of Britain's interests abroad. She also sharply criticized Prime Minister James Callaghan's ineffectual handling of the chaotic labor strikes of 1978 and 1979. In March 1979, Callaghan was defeated by a vote of no confidence, and on May 3rd, a general election gave Thatcher's Conservatives a 44-seat majority in Parliament. Sworn in the next day, Prime Minister Thatcher immediately set about dismantling socialism in Britain. She privatized numerous industries, cut back government expenditures, and gradually reduced the rights of trade unions. In 1983, despite the worst unemployment figures for half a decade, Thatcher was re-elected to a second term, thanks largely to the decisive British victory in the 1982 Falklands War with Argentina. Now, in other foreign affairs, the Iron Lady presided over the orderly establishment of an independent Zimbabwe, formerly Rhodesia, in 1980, and took a hard stance against Irish separatists in Northern Ireland. In October 1984, an Irish Republican Army, IRA, bomb exploded at the Conservative Party conference in Brighton. The Prime Minister narrowly escaped harm. In 1987, an upswing in the economy led to her election for a third time. But Thatcher soon alienated some members of her own party because of her poll tax policies and opposition to further British integration into the European community. In November 1990, she failed to receive a majority in the Conservative Party's annual vote for selection of a leader. She withdrew her nomination, and John Major, the Chancellor of the Exchequer since 1989, was chosen as Conservative leader. On November 22nd, she announced a resignation, and six days later was succeeded by Major. Thatcher's three consecutive terms in office marked the longest continuous tenure of a British Prime Minister since 1827. In 1992, she was made a baroness, and she took a seat in the House of Lords. In 2011, the former Prime Minister was the subject of an award-winning and controversial biographical film, The Iron Lady, and Merle Streep was magnificent as Margaret Thatcher. You ought to see it if you haven't. Then make your own choice how bad it was. Let me go back. In 2011, the former Prime Minister was the subject of an award-winning and controversial biographical film, The Iron Lady, which depicted her political rise and fall. Margaret Thatcher died on April 8, 2013, at the age of 87, following a stroke. I sincerely enjoy bringing these stories to you. And again, just a reminder that uh, you can know whenever I'm going to be doing anything uh, on the, uh, on either reachmorenow.com or reachmorenow YouTube, which is usually the very same thing. But you'll be able to tell if you go over to the Reach More Now YouTube and just hit that subscribe button. That mean a lot to me. And it, it would help us a lot in reaching more now.